Hi, it's, uh, it's great to be back here after three years on this same stage. Um, as you've been told, I'm a lawyer. I feel kind of out of place in rooms full of scientists. I haven't looked at science since I was 16 years old, taking my O-levels. So that goes away back. And if you were listening to the wonderful conversation last night between um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Richard Dawkins, you kind of got the opinion, the general view of lawyers that is held. So I'm a proud member of the 97% of lawyers that Dr. Tyson talked about. I will say that if you come to a lawyer's conference, you should hear the smack that we talk about astrophysicists when we're there. <laughs> I'm also, as you can probably get from the accent, I'm not from these parts. I'm, I'm English, and as uh, Sima Yasmin told us, we're all super-powered superheroes, the English, apparently. Now, you can clearly tell the falsity of that. If you think we're superheroes, watch us play in the World Cup just one time and take a look at Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg. So I'm here to talk about pseudoscience and the law, the interaction here, and why doesn't the government stop the charlatans? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to be touching that microphone. Um, when we look at the marketplace in which we live in, the marketplace is a fundamentally, fundamentally different place to Economics 101, if anyone studied that. We live in a world that isn't this basis of a free market, market clearing, that the market itself gets rid of bad products, that the right product wins out. I mean, it's possible that was the case that it worked with Neanderthals ch uh, trading skins for, for flint tools. But the world has fundamentally changed since then. We live in a world of flim-flam, scams, incompetence, and fundamental lack of care. And part of that, one of the reasons I actually joined this is I, I now get to use the term flim-flam in a professional uh, way, and it's wonderful. We live in a world where there is a priority given to profit over service. And we're told time and time again that there's the principle of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. But I think it's disputable that was ever true, and it's certainly not true. We have a situation with a huge informational imbalance. When we as the consumer are trying to buy things, we have far less information than the manufacturers. Even now with the internet, and the information that was available to us is massively increased over the last few years. If I've learned anything from listening to people over the last two days speaking, information in and of itself isn't necessarily a good thing. So we see all these, uh, these frauds rife in society. The tobacco industry lied to us for decades to put out a product that was killing people. French wine tainted with antifreeze. Volkswagen cars, if anybody owned a Volkswagen diesel here, you were fundamentally lied to by a company. And big oil companies and their lies about global warming. A lot's been talked on that, but that's not really what I've been working on. I'm, I'm looking at the much smaller level. The whole, the infomercials that lie to you, the psychics, the retail stores, essentially the growth um, and availability of snake oil. You see it every day. Anytime you go shopping, you see this. Anytime you turn on the TV, you see this. And very often we look to the government to protect us in this. Um, and the government does this in multiple ways. It does it through legislation and regulation. It passes laws. It then regulates based on those laws. It litigates and enforces those laws in theory. And it educates the population to protect itself. Again, when we see the education system, we can see how that has not necessarily 
been the most successful situation. Problem being, government enforcement just simply doesn't always work. There's a whole lot of issues of this, and I could spend the next five or six hours talking about them, but just to hit on a few of them. In the United States, we talk about the difference between state law and federal law. Most consumer protection law is done on a state basis, but then the regulation of drugs, the regulation of many things is on a federal basis. I was given the impression that around 150 years ago, 100, yeah, 150 years ago, we had a big argument about the state-federal divide, and we sorted it all out. Apparently not, and we run into these problems now, um, legal terms, preemption, preclusion. The one that you see it most in public is over gun laws, when cities and states are told that they can't effectively regulate guns. We also, within the government, see multiple agencies that have responsibility in this area. In the drugs arena, we look at the Food and Drug Administration and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. So within that, you get conflicting interests between these agencies. They have their own set of priorities. They cross over one another. You get a series of turf wars going on. You then get the problem of agency capture. This can happen in the nasty way of you know, the big bags of money, but also less nefarious. If you work regulating an industry, you start to go native. You start to know people within that industry. These are your friends. They're not going to lie to you. And we also see the problem of government sloth. The government works incredibly slowly any time it, it works at all. So now I want to talk to you about what I do, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how the government regulates homeopathy. So the first question is, why, why do I focus on homeopathy? And I get this from my old law firm friends who make huge sums of money, and they're intrigued that I am now working for a small nonprofit going after this what they see as a minor problem that no one's ever heard of. So why homeopathy? If any of you were here three years ago and I gave my presentation, I described homeopathy as the Scientology of pseudoscience. It's the one that's just totally off the chart. It's the one that is complete and utter bullshit. In this, but it goes further than that, and, and I've been trying to work out what makes me so angry about homeopathy. And what makes me angry is it is such a true pseudoscience. It dresses itself as a science. It masquerades as a science when it has no basis to do so. I can't think of other pseudosciences that are in your face when you walk into the grocery store, when you walk into the pharmacist on this. Reiki healing is completely full of crap. We all know this. But you have to go out and seek a Reiki healer. If you've just had a long day at work and your kid has got pink eye, and you're coming home and you stop the car outside the CVS and you run in and the kid's screaming as you drag him along by his hand, and you know you've got to get home because you've got to put dinner on as well, you just grab what's on the shelf that treats pink eye, and this is labeled with a colorful picture on it, and it says, all natural, no drug interactions, safe for children. That's why I get mad about it, because it's taking the $20 and stealing it from the people, and this makes me angry. So what does the government do? Government regulatory structure for this, everything is based under the 1938 Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. You look at the date, this is part of the New Deal. When we actually had a government that recognized the government had a responsibility to protect people with lesser information. This regulates all drugs. It, um, I always like to include a Simpsons cartoon, but seeing as I've been mad at everyone about copyright law, I've had to stop doing that. So thank God PBS is public domain, so you can still get Schoolhouse Rock. 
So you had the government coming into a situation where food standards were incredibly low. There's a very famous court case you all learn about in law school where there was a product called near milk being sold during the Great Depression. And this was basically diluted milk that was distributed around. And it's what people could afford. So you get the growth of government regulation. Unfortunately, this 1938 Act includes the HPUS, the Homeopathic Pharmacopoeia of the United States, as an official pharmacopoeia. So anything in this homeopathic, the big bump book of homeopathic bullshit, anything in this book counts as a drug in the US. Not great, got to admit. What does the FDA do? The FDA regulates the drugs we have. It, any new drug that comes out, it has to be proven to be safe and effective, otherwise it can't come to market. If you're bringing an OTC, an over-the-counter drug, all you have to show is that the product is already out there. The ingredients are out there. Now, 1938, for the longest time, we didn't care about homeopathy with good reason. Because, you know, if real doctors weren't putting this out, it, it wasn't a big deal. But we saw this growth through the 70s of this mistrust of science, this notion that big pharma was out to get us. And so as a result, you started seeing homeopathy being pushed more and more into the mainstream until now, as I said, you see it on your pharmacy shelves. So the FDA came out with, and uh, wonderful technical terms here, CPG 400-400. Um, that's Compliance Policy Guide. How are they going to enforce it? They said, essentially, you can sell homeopathy, and I don't know if everyone can read this, you can sell homeopathy, but here's what we're going to require that you do. You have to put the name on it, the name of the ingredient, in English as well as Latin. You can't just put Annus Barbari on the back of it. You have to put Annus Barbari, a.k.a. the liver and heart of the Muscovy duck, on this, you can't put, uh, what's it, sacred sucrose something or other. It's table sugar. You have to put it in English on this. So that's what they said. Turned around, 2019, they realized this just wasn't working. So they revoked 400-400. They replaced it with a risk-based enforcement policy. Risk-based enforcement. So if you targeted old people, if you targeted children, if you'd said your homeopathic potion could cure a serious disease like cancer, or if you had to inject it rather than just take a sugar pill, the FDA would come down on you like a ton of bricks, allegedly. It's 2022 here, they have still not finalized the regulation to replace CPG 400-400. Then let's turn to the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC, this regulates the advertising and the marketing of those drugs. They turned around, we finally won with them in 2016, and they put out an enforcement policy statement. I have to read these things on a daily basis. This is not fun. But luckily, because I'm your lawyer friend, I've pulled out the important part. They basically said that you needed to put a label on homeopathic products that says, one, this doesn't work, and two, it's based on theories before we really knew anything at all about science. We were really proud of this. They actually, I maintain, stole some of this from the recommendation we gave them on that. So we were really happy when this came out. Okay. Let's look at how it goes in practice, because you've all been in the pharmacy, and you've all seen that FTC warning label on, haven't you? That's every homeopathic product has that now. You've all seen on the back of the homeopathic products that they have it in English as well as Latin. No, they don't. None of this has happened. And, and I went online to find an example, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, homeopathic house call. This is concierge medicine if you don't want medicine. 
You don't want to get better at all. Homeopathy now within reach. How do they describe homeopathy? It's safe, non-toxic doses. It's natural substances like pretty flowers and berries. It stimulates your body to heal itself. It's a 200-year-old system, which admittedly so was slavery. It's a 200-year-old system of healing that's proven to be effective. They're regulated by the FDA, and they're manufactured according to strim uh, stringent standards. Tell that to the parents of the kids who died from giving their children belladonna for teething because there was too much belladonna in the product. So this is online at the moment. You can go search for it. You can sign up for this. You then click through about five links, and you get to the disclaimer. Here's the disclaimer. What does the disclaimer tell us? This is not intended to replace qualified medical attention. Nothing contained is intended to make diagnoses, prescriptions, or recommended treatments. I don't know if I'm crazy, but it seems like this and this tell you a very different story than the disclaimer that they hide away. So there's a problem here. There's an obvious problem, and that problem is, as the title of the talk says, why aren't the government properly regulating the charlatans? Why aren't they doing anything about it? Well, the first answer is, and it's kind of depressing, they can't. They simply don't have the competence to do it, they don't have the necessary information, and they don't have the resources. They deal with constant misrepresentation on this. When I started suing the homeopathic companies, they launched this campaign amongst their supporters that the tagline is, they are trying to take away your right to homeopathic products, to buy homeopathic products. I wish I was. I'd love to, don't get me wrong, no one say that outside this room, please. I'd love to, but all I'm trying to do is say, put a proper label on the thing. But they represented as I'm trying to go into little Timmy's bedroom and steal away the real medicine that's been keeping him alive these years. So they can't do it. It's also, they, they really don't want to do this. I talked earlier about regulatory capture and the impact of lobbying. Unfortunately, because you people don't give us enough money, the homeopathic industry has more money to bribe Congress with than we do. Give deep, everybody. Reach deep. Finally, a lot of the time, they think they've got better things to do, and I can understand that, because I'm asking them to protect the consumer who gets ripped off for $18. I understand why they may actually think it's more important to curb what's happening with the tobacco industry. I mean, if they were actually doing these things, I'd be even more happy, but maybe, yeah, maybe address global warming would be a good thing. So there's a series of these competing priorities, but what the situation with homeopathy, what we've got is the worst of both worlds. We have a system of federal regulation that's actually reasonably strict, but it's never enforced. What does that mean? It means homeopathic, homeopathic house call can sit there and say, we are FDA regulated, and they're not lying, because technically there's a regulation, it just never gets enforced. So we end up, in true American fashion, as good lawyers with lawsuits. We have lots of problems with these lawsuits. I mean, there's the obvious, and I talked about this three years ago. Who do we sue? Where do we sue? What law do we sue under? How do we get standing on this? But as you heard last night, perhaps the most fundamental one is that the system, the legal system, is fundamentally broken. Now, I'm allowed to say this because I'm a lawyer. We can bust on our own. Again, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you're not one of us. You don't get to tell us that the legal system is broken. But what we're doing, it, it's unbelievable the amount of law that is out there. 
It is said, and I, this is one of those horrible rumor things that can't be tested, but I'm gonna get away with saying it anyway, that on average a person commits two felonies a day, and that's just the criminal law. I don't commit two felonies a day, but I do know Kenny Biddle, and I know he is up there and covers the felonies for many of you. So buy him a drink to thank him later. There's so much law out there. There are so many regulations out there that you as individuals, the companies, that even the government that's meant to enforce it simply doesn't know everything. And this grows every year. Between 1995 and 2011, the federal government passed 4,312 laws. And remember, this is a time when we're told that there's gridlock in Congress and they can't pass anything. 4,312 laws, but those laws don't really affect you because they go to an agency and the agency then writes a regulation. Regulation affects you. Over that same time period, there were 88,899 new regulations added by the federal government. If you take the CFR, which is the publication that has all of the federal regulations in, that now consists of 185,984 pages. No one can follow that. It's simply not possible, so you get choice by the government of what they enforce. And we see tragedies as a result of that. You see people, it's the whole notion of, of systemic racism, of, of differential law enforcement, but you also see with things like this that the Government just turns around and just, it's like homeopathy, oh, just get on with it. Also, as I've mentioned before, and as Neil mentioned last night, and he's right, the law does science so badly, fundamentally badly. We are an adversarial system. We're not about finding a fact. It's about persuasion. And I know scientists don't like that, but it's the scientists who we bring in to be expert witnesses who participate in that. It's a terrible system, but the one thing I will say is nobody has found a better system than it. It's a system that doesn't work, but it's by far from the worst out there. So what we do, I wanna talk for a moment, my last few minutes, about what I've been doing, the lawsuits I've been bringing, and a bit broader. The first thing I did is we set up the Office of Consumer Protection from Pseudoscience. My baby, I'm very proud of this. You can follow our lawsuits by going there. You can also, and this is the thing we need to advertise more, and I'm sorry I haven't done a better job of it. You can go there, you can find out who your state person you can complain about things to is, and you can write to me, and I can complain about them as well, if it's something we're looking at. We've also brought a lawsuit against Boiron. Boiron, the world's largest manufacturer of homeopathic products. French company. And what we've done here, it's kind of, I call it, a, you know, a kitchen sink lawsuit. We've accused them of, of about 40 or 50 different types of fraud. Because it's, it's, this is the weird thing about the law. It's really hard to sue them for selling a completely worthless, crap, meaningless product that doesn't work. Because they're kind of allowed to do that under the law. So we started thinking, ah, how are they committing fraud? And me and my colleague came up with an idea that we bought five products from them that treat, one of them treats influenza, one of them treats insomnia, one of them treats like itchy skin, all these different ideas, and we tested them. We ran scientific tests on them, and lo and behold, as we knew, these five products are absolutely 100% identical. So them selling the first one, let's say for influenza isn't fraud, but we argue, you could take that influenza one for insomnia. You could take that influenza one 
for relief of itchy skin because it's the same thing. So the fraud comes in that you are trying to sell five products to someone rather than one product. That one's actually going to discovery. We're going to start finding stuff out about Byron, and that's fun. <laughs> We've written warning letters to Amazon.com and Chewy because we believe in suing small companies first. <laughs> because they sell all this stuff, and my colleague Aaron, who unfortunately can't be here, he came to us from the American Humane Association, and he gets really mad at vets using homeopathy, and he's right to be mad. So we wrote to them saying, you can't just be pushing this nonsense on people. And they, they're like, well, no, it's not that we recommend it. We just sell it. Go to Amazon, type in flu relief and see what comes back. Amazon's choice. Pretty difficult in my mind for them to say that is not a recommendation of a product. Of course, we all know that they do that because Boyron pay them money to do that. But they are still recommending that product. And then finally, we've got the ones I think you might be wanting to hear about. CVS and Walmart. Three years ago, I stood up here and told you all we'd launch this Don Quixote type campaign of tilting at windmills, of taking on two of the retail giants for homeopathy. And I've been dying to tell you something about it since, but the courts were slow. So I arranged for a pandemic so there wouldn't be a conference for a couple of years. And then unfortunately, and I hate saying this, we lost. We lost both cases in district court. We didn't just lose, we lost embarrassingly badly. And we were told, one, we didn't have standing because CFI was not a consumer protection organization. They argued that we oppose pseudoscience because it's wrong, not because it hurts people. Two, we lost because we didn't state a claim. We didn't say how people were hurt by this. I spent three quarters of the brief explaining how people were hurt by this. I was annoyed. That's the polite version. So we appealed. We argued the appeal in January 2022. We got a verdict two weeks ago. Combined the two cases for appeal. They said, we are a consumer protection organization, which clearly the 20 or 30 years of legal work we've done. But importantly, they turned around and said the product placement as a matter of law is making a representation to a customer. So huge retailers can't just say, we put it on the shelf. That's all we do. You put it on the shelf in a particular way. I'm out of time, I just want to let you know where that's going now. We won the appeal and that was fantastic. <laughs> Unfortunately, they then filed a petition for rehearing, which is basically, give me a do-over. It's like when you go to your parents and say, I lost the game with my brother but I'm younger than him, so I should get a second try. They're very rarely granted. We hope it won't be granted here. This has got to the level of seriousness that a national retail organization filed an amicus brief on their, half, on their behalf that this appeal should be reheld because they are terrified they're going to be held accountable for where they put their products. We're going to win on this. We're going to win, we're going to go forward, we're going to go into discovery, and we're going to make them change their practices, if only in DC for now. But we can't do it. We couldn't have done it without your support. Uh, Todd Stiefel, Todd, are you here? Todd has been with us since the beginning. I can't thank him enough. All of you, when you come to conferences like this, 
When you buy our magazines, when you donate to the organization, when you become a member, you're making this lawsuit possible, and I want to thank all of you for that. Thank you.